Thank you. Um, for answer, I thank you very much for facilitating the opportunity to turn here. Um, this is a nice uh, facility to do this in. It's a lot more jobs than what we did tonight. But uh, I appreciate you all coming. It's very good that you came and are interested in education and funding. A lot of people don't understand, and a lot of people aren't that interested in funding of education, but it's an important key to how we educate our kids. So I'm glad to see we have some people that are interested in that tonight. Um, I apologize if I move around. I talk on my hands, so I'm going to swing a mouse with a microphone. Please understand. I do that sometimes. So, what are we going to talk about tonight? We're going to talk about the state of spending on education. We're going to talk, we're going to talk about the operating funds for K 12 schools, capital outlay funds for K 12 schools, the Florida lottery, local funding, other impact, other trends impacting the education funding, long term impacts on education funding, and then we'll have an opportunity questions and comments. So let's start with the funding of education in the state of Florida. This is the funding breakdown from 2003 to 2018. This is how the state has spent their money. This comes from their finance reports that they send out at the end of every year. It's often by the government. So this is the accurate information they provide. And what this is, this is the primary services that are provided by the state of Florida. And you will see that education takes up in 2003 takes about a third of the spending in the state of Florida. Human services takes a little bit more than a third, and then you see criminal justice, natural resources, transportation, state courts, and general government. So that was in 2003. What does it look like today? Well, the last, the most up-to-date information we have is 2018, because their fiscal year ends June 30th, which is very so far since the year ago. And you'll see that human services is now taken up almost 48% of the spending for the state of Florida. But what you'll also see is that education is now closer to a quarter. So you can see, percentage-wise, the spending in education has actually gone down. The total amount spent for education has gone up. They are, they are in fact, right when they say that they're spending more money on education. But the percentages of what the state spends today is less compared to the other categories. And this education that we're talking about, I want to be clear up front that this is, this is not K-12 education. It's not just K-12 education. This is all education. This is all the way from the all the way up through post-college. So um, that's what they spend on all categories and not just K-12. So this is just another chart to show you from 2003 to 2018. The blue across the bottom of the chart, that's what they've been spending on education in the state of Florida. The orange is what they've been spending on all the other services. And the red line is just showing the percentage. And you'll see that they used to spend about 33% on education in the state of Florida. And now they're closer to 27%. So that percentage has dropped over time. So we've talked about education funding as a whole, but we really want to narrow it down to K-12 because that's what impacts us the most here in our traditional schools in our community. So how do we primarily fund the operational expenses of education? The op we'll talk tonight about operational, we'll talk about capital. There is a difference. Operational is the day-to-day -day stuff. Capital is more of the, the land, the long-term assets, the things that we buy from the future. Um, so if you think about it like this, when you buy your car, that's a capital expense. When you put gas in your car, that's an operational expense. So how do we fund operational expenses for the state of Florida? Well, they primarily do that through the Florida Education Funding Program. And that funding program is set in the state, and its intention is, is to equalize the funding per student across the state, the entire state of Florida. So a student in Monroe County that has a real high tax basis shouldn't have that much more advantage over a student from Jefferson County that has a very low tax basis. So what happens is, is the FDAP formula is funded by state funds and local funds, our, our local tax dollars, which is raised from our, our, our taxes on our homes. But what happens is, is they get equalized across the state. So in counties where the home values are low, the state funds more funding than state dollars to make up that difference. So all the students are supposed to get a fairly consistent amount of funding across the state of Florida. So there's primary mechanisms of funding. 
um, is funding on state and local revenues and recognizes the Maryland local property taxes, education program costs, varying cost of living, cost of equivalent education programs, due to smart city and dispersion. That smart city dispersion talk, that is for counties that are small with large land masses, low numbers. So they have a lot further to go get those students to bring them in. It's a lot harder for them to provide those services. So the state recognizes that in the FAP formula and gives those counties additional dollars. So what does the Florida Education Pro Funding Program look like for Lake County students? Lake County students K-12, this doesn't matter. This is the funding for our traditional schools and our charter schools. Our charter school funding comes out of this. Um, let's say, and it's based on their FTE that they have. So we have at the top what we call the base funding, which is your number of students multiplied by the base of student allocation that the state of Florida sets. And then a district cost per provision. This is just the, the offsets the cost of the, of, of the first educated student based on the local economies. So the cost of living gets involved in the DCD uh, or the district cost of provision. The next line you'll see is best and brightest, and then you'll see the 0.78 milk compression, safe schools, ESC guaranteed allocation, supplemental academic allocation, structural materials, student transportation, teachers' classroom supplies, reading allocation, digital classrooms, mental health allocation, total funds compression, and the case scholarships. And the reason why I would go down the list there and list each one of those out for you is because one, I want you to see that at the top, you can see the term unrestricted in that column. Those funds are unrestricted. We can use those funds for any education purpose in our schools. So we can do everything from pay our teachers for that to turn on our lights. It's our basic operation funding for our school district that's not restricted to a different program. So the next line you see is the best and brightest. The best and brightest, and this is next year's funding, by the way. The best and brightest, and we'll talk about this later. Best and brightest is new to us this year in our formula. The program is not new to us, but the funding formula is new to us. So we'll talk about this later, but when we talk about how much the state of Florida increased education funding for the current year, you'll have to remember that part of that increase is that best and brightest right there. That doesn't benefit the district operations, it's passed on to the teacher, so it's indirect benefit through paying the teachers, but the payment is not in salary, it's in bonuses. Um, the 0.78 mill compression is simply if you are if your land values are lower to get you to the state average, they do what they call a compression to get you up to the state average. But if your land values are over that, you don't lose any funding. That's where a little bit of disparity comes between some of the counties. A county like ours, that has a little bit lower than state average land values, we get the compression dollars. But a county like Monroe County gets a significant amount of funding from their, their millage, but they don't lose that additional. So that's why students in Monroe County will actually be funded at a higher rate than they will later. Safe schools is restricted purely for safety of schools. We cannot use that dollar of funding for anything else. It can only be used for the safety of our students and our schools. And you'll see it's $2.6 million in the upcoming year for our SROs, for our county and for our municipalities, and our guardians that we have in some of our schools, it's over $4 million. So where the state gave us $2.6 million to keep our schools safe, for the cost of doing that is actually much greater than what they did. That's what they call, what I can call, consider a poorly funded mandate by the state. They require you to do something, they provide you funding, but the funding is not sufficient to really do what you need to do in that. ESC guarantee allocation, social academic, instructional materials, student transportation, classroom supplies. You'll see that all of these are restricted, or they are even passed on to someone else, like the teacher classroom supplies gets passed on directly to the teacher. Still benefits the schools because they're supposed to buy supplies and use it in their classroom. But when that funding gets increased by the state, it doesn't help our school district with the operating expenses that they have to require to keep up. So you'll see that the majority of those categories, and that's what they call it, categories, they are restricted to specific programs. So this is the part where I have to 
show you that this formula is actually very long. And this is just a summary of each one of the calculations. There's a page and a half to two pages to each calculation that shows you how it allocates across the districts. There's, there's just a handful of these allocations that follow the same formula based on student or based on need, but most of them have some kind of base amount that they give to every district and then they give a remaining amount on some other variable. So, as you can see, the MPFD formula is not as simple as a lot of people claim it to be. And, I'll, and, I, and I'm, let me back up here too also. You'll see that there's a three and a half million dollar deduction at the bottom. The, the, there's no minus sign, there's, there's the quotations and it's in red. That's actually a deduction of our funds. And the pay scholarships that are taken from our schools and given to the private scholarships, they're taking it from our unrestricted funds. They don't reduce any of our restricted funds when they do that. So what's happened over time and what's really eroded our ability to do a lot of things in our operations is in 2003, you'll see that that base student allocation that we talked about that's unrestricted. That unrestricted allocation used to be about 75% of the funding that we received. But over time, as, as they, they gave additional dollars, they also restricted the majority of the dollars that they gave us to specific programs. And that restriction makes harder for us to keep and maintain our operation expenses on that, on the other items. So you'll see that it was 75% in 2003, and today it's about 66%. The rest of it is now restricted to some other kind of funds. So that restricting of those funds also burdens our district and its ability to keep up its operating expenses. So this is what the base student allocation looks like every time. You can see in 2003, it was about 4500 per student. 2007 and 8, we enjoyed a little bit of increases in our land values. You remember the housing boom right before it popped. And then it popped, and after it popped, you'll see that the BSA dropped. And then you'll see the BSA continue to rise back up as the economy came back. But you'll see in 2016, 2017, the BSA is kind of flat. Okay. 2018 19, this current year, our BSA went up 47 cents per student. That wasn't even measurable to a percentage, it's just that it is a small. So most of the increase that we got in funding last year, obviously, was the safe schools we don't know. So if you took a line and posed it over that, just to kind of get a trend of what's it been like since 2003, you will see that we have had a 1.11% annual increase in our BSA. Folks, that's the money that we need to operate on. That's not restricted for other purposes. And it's just not sufficient to keep up. So here's the headlines this year. It says, Florida legislature finished with a K-12 budget with a $248 increase per student. That's actually a best grade. It's $243. This is from the tech contributor. They just, I think they must have gotten preliminary before it was actually finalized from the, from the, the legislature. So the highlight from the 2019 budget is the $75 per student increase in flexible district spending. Last year, that increased about 37 cents. So we're, all, we're very thankful for that $75 per student. It's a lot better than it was in the previous year of 47 cents. But still, that $75 per student is not, not that much more than that 1.1% trend that we've been getting over time. So still not enough. So some of the highlights for the 2020 FDFP, our budget that we're getting ready to do. This is some of the highlights that we have. $243 increase per student statewide. That's an average per student. That's not what we get. We'll talk about that in just a second. $75 increase in base student allocation. $97 of that $243 is investment advice. This is a program that was funded like a grant outside of the FDFP formula in the prior year. They added about $20 million to it statewide this year, and then they rolled it into the education funding formula. And then they said, we gave additional money to the schools and to the students in the state of Florida. Not really a new increase, just a shift of the way that they calculate that formula. Lake County Schools is ranked 62nd out of 67 in per student funding. Last year we were 58, we dropped 67. Mainly because of the new year 
they've got schools that uh, they've got additional funding for schools that are that are failing schools, consistently failing schools, and they're giving five hundred dollars per student to those schools. We didn't have any of those schools currently in our district, so we didn't get any of that funding. So those that that funding went to other districts and not to us. Lake County schools per student funding only increased two hundred and two point fifty two. So two hundred two dollars fifty two cent per student is all we got in our increase. If you listen to the press, if you listen to the state, if you listen to the legislature, if you listen to the DOB, they will all tell you never forgot two hundred and forty three dollars per student. That's not the reality, that's not what happened. That forty one dollar difference would be an additional one point nine eight million dollars for our county. We really got funded up to two hundred and forty three. We had almost two million extra dollars to add to our operation. So how have we done some other things? You know, everybody always says, well, what are you doing about teacher pay? Teacher pay is important to everybody. It's important to teachers. It's important to us administrators because we have to work. We have to get productivity out of it. You should pay your teachers good wages like you would any. So what's happened over time? I went back on some old paperwork. This is not me. I mean, I've been here for a year, but in 2003, I found where our average teacher salary was $37,652. Today, it's 45000 so that's a 1.3 percent increase over time. Not much, but more than what that BSA has been increasing. So yes, it should be more, but at the same time, it's hard to do that when your BSA is only going up with 1.1 percent. So the other things, MRS contribution here, compulsory by the state of Florida, we have to participate in the Florida retirement system, and each year they adjust that retirement contribution up and down. And that retirement contribution since 2003 has gone up about 4.57 million average per year. So uh, that's an additional cost to FRS. Now this did not cost our district, but there's another thing that's not on that piece of paper that needs to be said. Teachers around 2012-2013, along with all other state and uh, district employees, we now have to contribute 3%, whereas before we did. Not against making contributions for your retirement. I think it's a good thing. I just think the timing could have been at a worse time because we were seeing a lot of funding cuts and we weren't able to really get pay raises. So in those years, our teachers actually lost some of the ability to make purchases and their living. Health insurance contribution. Health insurance contribution, 7.16% over time. That sounds significant, but if you really look at what the industry trends are with the, um, the change in the Health Care Act, that's really not that far off from the industry. The other thing that we have to do with is we have to actually insure our retirees at the exact same cost that we insure our current employees. Well, retirees, no offense, but when they get a little bit older, they seem to become a little bit more expensive. And a lot of industries, a lot of businesses are allowed to charge the retirees an additional amount. We are not. So everybody gets funded the same. Appreciate our retirees. I'm not saying anything negative about that. I'm just pointing that out. Um, and then the payroll taxes. Luckily, the payroll taxes have not changed, but they've gone up to the percent of the average of your salary. So you can see a 1.95% increase in paying our teachers since 2003 to today. Nothing to write home about. It's not all that great. But when you look at of the funding increase, you start to understand what the real description is there. Energy services, I just started to say, because these are other things that we have to budget every year. Uh, whether we get funded for it or not, energy services, our lights, keeping our lights on, our other utilities, you can see about a 4.97% increase. That's probably not a real cost increase, but that's just the increase because we have a lot more facilities now than we did in 2003. So as you add schools, you obviously add your decision at cost. Property casualty insurance is kind of an anomaly. We were uh, fully insured back in 2003. We went self funded. Uh, since we've gone self funded, our property casualty and our workers' comp rates have gone down. So we are actually seeing some cost savings in there. I just thought that that should be pointed out. Not everything, but other some things happen. So here's the financial condition ratio. The state of Florida has a statute that says that we have to maintain at least 
is a 3% fund balance. So at the end of the year, we have to have at least a balance of 3% of extra revenues. Okay, that's how they measure it. And you can see if you want to pay in 2003, you have to pay in 2006. Housing women came in a little bit up. 2010 and 11, the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act came in and they gave us additional federal dollars. And for one time, we were actually allowed to shift general operating dollars to a federal program. Typically, you're not allowed to do that. They have the departments that say that you cannot do that. If you do that, they take that money back from you. So this is one time they allowed to do that. And what that did was it allowed us to show lower revenues with a lot lower expenditures. And that allowed our fund balance to maintain at a higher rate. 2010-2011, it ended. And in 2012, you can see a sharp decline in our financial position ratio. You can see 2015 to 16 to 17, the decline down to 3%. And we are holding it right at 3% right now. So we had kind of hoped this year that we were going to see a little bit of an increase. We would make some headway. We took some positions out. We were going to save some money. But our health insurance costs came in a little bit higher. And because of that, we had to spend a little bit more money. So we've talked all about the operational. Let's talk a little bit about capital outlay. Again, capital outlay is your car, not your gas. It's the, it's the big purchases. It's your land, it's your buildings, it's your parking lots, your fences, it's your desk, your equipment. A lot of those things, your school buses, they're all paid for out of what they consider capital outlay funding. So they're invested in long term assets. Uh, they can only be used, funding for capital outlay can only be used to fund initial purchases and major renovations of long term assets. They cannot be expended on the day to day operations. Assets. So we can refurbish a school, we can remodel a school, but we can't we can't pay the custodian out of school on a day-to-day -day basis to do what they do. All state capital outlay funds must be expended on building new educational facilities, debt service, or renovating existing facilities. So we cannot take any state capital outlay dollars and purchase buses or equipment or anything like that. It's all pretty much facility driven. Our local capital outlay funds which is part of our tax exempt charge. Um, those proceeds can be used to construct parts of new facilities, make the repairs, and then remodel. And then they also are primarily spent on purchasing buses and being other vehicles, and then our furniture fixture and equipment. And this is important to say because a lot of times we get the we get a, we get the question, well, you just went out and bought 30 new buses, why didn't you give somebody a raise? Teachers, custodians, it doesn't matter, anybody. Um, well, because of misuse of capital funds for operating purposes, will result in a dollar for dollar reduction in the FDFP the following year. So if the auditor comes in and says, you misuse those funds, the next year they take it out of our general operating dollars at the state agency. So it doesn't do us any good uh, to do that. So there's three major programs of state funding for capital outlay, and I wanted to talk to it because it's very important to see this. There's a CODS program, Capital Outlay Debt Service. It's funded by the Motor Vehicle License and Registration Tax, so every time you register your vehicle, there's a slight tax on there and it helps fund some construction schools. Um, district elects to participate in the state bonding program, allowing districts to pledge future proceeds in order to address current needs. So this funding is not sufficient enough to go out on any district level to go out and build a full facility. There's, there's not enough there. It's usually about six or seven hundred thousand dollars, so you can't go to school. You can't even buy a land for that. So it's really used to just kind of augment and remodel some facilities. But what a lot of districts have done in the past is the state each year goes out and says, I'm going to bid or I'm going to bond out the next 20 years of this revenue in a revenue bond. And I'm going to get all the money today for the next 20 years. So when my when my revenue comes in, I'm just going to use it for debt service. And then school districts can participate in that, and they'll get a lot more proportion. They'll get 20 years worth of one time, essentially. And then when they do that, they can actually go out and build a facility. But here's the important part. State hasn't done any new bonding since 2010. So since 2010, no districts have had the ability to use those funds to build a new facility because there's not enough there. ECO funding, Public Education Capital Outlay Funding. This is originally designed for universities and colleges, and then uh, at some point in time, 
the state decided to use the aid bill for facilities, they got that responsibility. So they started tapping it. It became one of the major funding for Capital Wildlife for the state for a number of years. But around 2000, 2010, they started backing that back down, and now we can see it. Uh, we were getting last year, we were getting some maintenance money, uh, about $700,000, but now we're getting zero right at the upcoming year. They're now taking the school portion of this, and they've, they've given it back to the universities, they've given it back to the community colleges, and now this is how the state is funding the capital outlay source for charter schools in the state of Florida. So if a charter school in the state of Florida is in a building that's not owned by the district, the state gives them the capital outlay funding, and this is where it comes from. So what happened to Pico? They used to bond it exactly the same way. They automatically bonded. It wasn't a district participation. As soon as they got their revenue projection for the upcoming year, they figured out how much they need for debt service and the rest of the amount remaining, they bonded for the future. And so that provided a lot of funding for capital purposes in the state of Florida for a hundred years. So they stopped bonding that uh, in 2012. They had allocated any new funds for new construction since 2009. So since 2009, school districts haven't received any money to build new schools for people. In 2020, the state did not allocate any money. And then we talk about the lottery programs. We'll talk about lottery in more detail. But this is one of the capital programs, so I thought that it was important to, to bring up here. Funding by lottery proceeds. Funded by lottery proceeds. So this is a program that this is where a lottery dollar will go. So a lot of people always ask, well, we always you're always complaining about funding, but we've got the Florida lottery. You know, what's what's the Florida lottery doing? This is what the Florida lottery is part of what the Florida lottery. So they, they portion off a portion of the lottery program proceeds and they, they say this is going to be used for capital outlay purposes for K-12 schools. Well, in response to the Class Size Reduction Act in the late 2000s, they went out and they bonded all the annual proceeds for the next 20, 25 years. So since 2009, we haven't received any funding from the Florida Lottery to build a K-12 facility. All of the funding that's being raised today is being used to pay debt service on buildings that funding came through in 2009 2010. They haven't allocated any funds for construction since 2009. So all of our state funding for capital outlay currently is going away, except for the little amount that we get from CLDS. So let's talk about our local capital outlay funds. So local capital outlay millage, this is a millage, the millage is 1,000 of a value of your home property in, in Lake County. Um, it can be used, as we said earlier, for buses and equipment, not can be used for, for buildings, etc. Since 2010, Lake County Schools, this district has lost $110 million in capital funding. That's enough to build a couple of caves. That's enough to build one high school and have a little bit left over. So what, what are we left with? Well, we're left with impact fees. Impact fees are the fee that's charged every time someone builds a home and pulls a permit. The county charges them an impact fee, and they provide it to us. And it's based on the study of what the impact of building that home is to our schools or capital effective as well as support. And then we have sales tax proceeds. This county levies a one penny sales tax that's been approved. We'll talk about that in more detail later. And, um, it's good for another 15 years, so we're not going to go that for anything anytime soon. It just got passed again in 2015. I think it's about to be a But uh, but it's only it can only be used for remodeling projects. It's not used for buses. It can be used for a little bit of, of um, electronic equipment, upgrading our routers and our handling and stuff for our schools. Uh, our infrastructure there, but, but not, it's really generally used for remodeling our schools. So let's talk a little bit more detail about the Florida Lottery. So um, I had to do this when I, when I prepared this for the first time, it was a couple months ago, and the legislature hadn't, hadn't finished yet, so they had to make all of their appropriations. And my intent here was to take the 2018 graph out the 2019 graph in, excuse me, 19 and 20. So when I did that, I said, you know, such a huge difference here, I think I need to leave this in. Because I think you'll see what happened. This is what happened to our funding. 
So if you look at 2019, which is the current year, you'll see that the vision of universities and the Florida college system takes up about 25%. The Bright Future Scholarship Program for our students to attend college takes up about another 25%. And then you'll see that the K-12 operation, the light blue on the left-hand side or the right-hand side, is for, um, for us. And then you see the K-12 debt service. That's what we just referred to about all that money being bonded through the lottery proceeds. And then you see workforce development at the bottom. There's 88 million dollars in workforce development. Workforce development funds flow to our school, but they cannot be spent on any K-12 student. They have to be spent on students who are outside of the normal K-12 operation. So this is kind of like our unfolded funding and some other programs that we have. It's not for our general K-12 students. So when I pulled it out and put the new graph in, I said, you know what, that's a major change that I think it should be pointed out. Last year, the state of Florida decided that, that they were going to <coughs> boost the Florida Bright Future Scholarship Program by $200 million, and they reduced Florida K-12 operations by $195 million. So you can see what happened. They took it out of K-12 and shifted it right around to Florida Bright Future. Now, I'm not condemning or knocking the Bright Future program. That's not my intent here at all. If they want to fund it, I think that's great. I just don't like the idea of taking it from K-12 and putting it in Bright Futures because if our students are educated properly, they're not going to have a problem. Just say that. Um, so, you know, 2002, you know, what, what, what has happened to the Florida lottery in the last 20 years? 2002, the citizens passed class size amendment. I'm not saying anything negative about the class size amendment, but what I'm saying is it was very costly, and the way that our legislators decided to fund that was with lottery dollars. Since the approval of the class size amendment, Florida has spent $40.3 billion for operation expenses just related to class size. Between 2003 and 2008, Florida issued bonds in order to appropriate $2.5 billion for school facilities to address the class size requirements. And that's part of that lottery that we talked about earlier that we don't get any more money from because they bonded it all in 2009. So let's talk about local funding. Add lower tax or tax dollar homes and our other income producing property. Each year the legislators determine how much taxes we can levy. This is an important difference between our taxing authority and other taxing authorities in our county. Our county, our hospital authority, our water authority, our city municipalities, they all have flexibility. They're capped at 10 mills, but they have the flexibility to raise and decrease their funding. But we have what they call the required local effort millage, and that millage is determined by the state of Florida. If we want to participate in the state of Florida program with FDFP funding, we have to adopt that millage. No more or no less. And that's how the state tries to guarantee that everybody's funding at a level that, that contributes as much uh, based on their, their tax values. Um, in 2003, the annual tax rate for schools was 8.395 mills. For 2020, it is now 6.163 mills. That includes all millages, including capital. So you can see since 2003 until now, the tax rate has gone down for us, and it's not at our option. This is something that the state of Florida has, has done for us. There's also something called the Save Our Homes Act. I mentioned that because there's a very important calculation. This act limits the increase of our property values to the lesser of the consumer price index, or 3%. So as our home values go up, they get capped at 3%. So if your home value goes up more than then 3%, if the consumer index goes up 4%, we're still only allowed to value that home at 3%. We don't actually value the home, that's actually the property appraiser for the county that does that. So, so over time, what's happened? An owner of a home with a tax value of $100,000 paid $842.50 in taxes for education for 2003. That same home, would have a maximum taxable value. So if it was a, a home that always appreciated the maximum amount, it didn't have anything that depreciated that value, which we know it did be valued at some point in time between here and here. That same home with a maximum taxable value of 
$136,500 today. That's the most that our property appraiser can appraise that home at today. That's the most that we can tax it at today. And the homeowner would pay $841.42 in taxes. So you can see the intent of our legislature has been to decrease the rate of taxes and keep our homeowners from paying anything additional. That sounds good on the political side, and it's really a great thing for a homeowner. But what's happened is this, that's where a lot of our funding has gone down. And you can see on that chart, 2016, 17, 18, and 19 is where most of that increase has come from. So we really are starting to get that. Okay. Some other trends impacting education. Additional unfunded or poorly funded mandates. And this is a point in time where I'm going to use another visual. This is the Florida statutes that are specific just to the school boards and colleges. It's very thin. I don't know if you can see it from the audience. Very fine print. I don't use this. I search it on Google. <laughs> There's no way. But everything in this book guides us on how we operate our school district, all the way from what the superintendent does at her office, all the way down to our teachers and our custodians and all of our employees, our bus drivers and everything. It's all in here. And I will tell you, there are very few maids in here. There are a ton of shouts. We are required to do a lot of stuff. And when we're required to do something and we're not funded correctly, that cuts into our ability to spend our operation dollars. So like earlier when I talked about the, the mandates for school safety, everybody would love school safety, we all want school safety. We, we all want to be safe and more kids safe. But at the same time, when that mandate came through, the requirement was so expensive and the funding was just not enough. So that $2 million that had to be made up from the, came out of our normal operating expense. So even though they funded it and they're restricted it, the mandate exceeded the restriction and further restricted other funds through that mandate. If you look at some of our other programs, like transportation, transportation is always a good example. We are required to transport every student outside of two miles unless if there's some kind of hazardous condition. So if there's a student outside of the two miles zone, we have to pick that student up on the bus and bring them into school. And that funding that we get from the state only covers less than 50% of the cost to provide that transportation. So as our transportation costs go up, and our transportation funding has gone very little over the years, it's almost consistent. So when that funding stays consistent, but our gas prices have gone up, the cost of repairing our buses have gone up, the cost of driving our buses have gone up. So all of those costs, as those costs go up and funding stays flat, that cost is being absorbed out of those non-restricted funds that we get to the NSA. So changing economy more, how things testing requirements. That was a big, big plug when the, when the, when the governor and the new commission of education come in. One of the first things they said was, we're going to take out Common Core or high stakes. Well, they've kind of backed up on that. Some, I'm sure there'll be some adjustment. But what happens when they adjust? So they go and they make an adjustment. So when they adjust, our teachers have to relearn how they want to talk. They don't have to relearn how to teach, they know how to teach. They just have to relearn the way that the state wants it done. And then the structural materials will change. So when that comes around, we'll have to buy some more instructional materials because the methods have changed. So all of that adds a significant amount of expense to our operation. If you look at the accountability assessment, I'm not anti-accountability, I'm not anti-assessment, but it's been very, very expensive in the state of Florida. And part of the reason why it's very expensive is it changes. It changes every four to eight years. It usually changes about every time that the legislators and governors have power change. So when that power page comes to Tallahassee, we end up having to pay. Uh, expansion of private school voucher programs, um, continued reduction in local ad valorem taxes, increased competition for capital funding with other educational entities. Our um, universities and our, uh, especially our universities, are in Tallahassee very heavily with a lot of lobbying, a lot of strength, and they are getting a lot of funding. And that funding is that peak of dollars that we talked about earlier. So that leaves us very little. And this year, that doesn't zero. Um, and then additional constraints placed on the local funding initiatives. We are lucky enough in this district, 
um, this last year. We're very thankful, and I've got a slide about there, um, that we passed an additional 0.75 mil for safety to offset the cost of doing what we need to do for our students to ensure safe schools. Um, we also have the sales tax um, the initiative that we have that we can pass and participate in. A lot of these programs are being attacked at the state level because the state politicians don't like the voters to have an ability to vote a tax on themselves. We'll let that sink in for a second. If a person goes out and majority of the voters and they vote a tax against themselves, there are those in Tallahassee who don't think that they should be able to do that. And they've actually gone after the impact fees, they've gone after the sales tax referendums, and I'm not sure, I haven't seen them yet, but probably at some point in time, they may even go after the voter referendum for millions. So what are the long-term impacts from education? This is not a surprise to anybody, but I think you probably all have seen this in some of the trade reform. Uh, low base pay, couple of the performance-based salary increases. Class size reduction requirements, no require more teachers than what we had in the past. Increased teacher certification requirements, which they did pass in laws and uh, it took some of those restraints this last year. An aging teacher population, I'll look down on some of the way to get a very High stakes testing, um, as these high stakes testings come in, there's a lot of money going into high stakes testing and not necessarily where it should be put at. that. And then changes to the Florida retirement system. Remember where earlier we talked about the teachers having to pay that additional 3% along with all of the other employees? Well, something else changed for teachers about seven years ago. Teachers used to have the, teachers have the ability to go into a program they call the Deferred Retirement Option Program, or DROP, that we refer to it as. And they were allowed to stay for seven years after they retired, and their retirement checks accumulated in an account at 6.5%. And at the end of their time, this large balloon of ventures payment went to the teachers and they had a nice retirement fund. Well, they changed the law seven years ago. And when they did, they moved it down to two and a half percent. And what happened is every teacher who or other employee who had the ability to jump in that six and a half program did so seven years ago. So all those people that influx into there are now going out. So that is another component of our teacher shortage. But our main component not hard in this teacher salary. That's just been too much of an effect on this. School facilities. Schools are at or near full capacity. Uh, the class size reduction act also impacts that because now we have to build more classrooms to accommodate them because we put fewer students in that class size. I'm not anti class size, I'm saying that again. That's a good thing, but it is very expensive. Extended use of portable classrooms, failing school support infrastructure. How many of y'all went by a uh, elementary school and see people wrap all the way around the school trying to pick their kids up? Uh -huh. How many of y'all have seen lunchrooms that have to do three and four cycles to the lunchroom? What has happened in a lot of these cases is we used to build our schools to handle 800 students, and our infrastructure was designed for 800 students. So our cafeterias, our media centers, our front offices, parking lots, our bus loops, they were all designed to handle 800 students. We go in and we add a week or two, and we increase capacity to 1,000 or 1,200. Now we have 1,200 students. That school infrastructure wasn't designed for that. Our classrooms, we've got enough classrooms for them, but we don't have enough media center, we don't have enough cafeteria, we don't have enough parking lot. We lose play areas, we lose other areas and buffers that we used to have for safety. We lose that every time. It's because of our school facilities and everything. Uh, deferred maintenance and repair costs, as these buildings get older, they get more expensive. Right? And they are they're very costly to maintain, they're very costly to operate. And then the additional busing, as more students move in and we don't have the facility, that's more of a demand on our buses to get our kids to our school safe. And then the decrease in operation efficiency. So, what is all this about? This is all about the Florida Constitution that basically says the education of children is a fundamental value of the people of the state of Florida. It is therefore a paramount duty of the state to make adequate provisions for education of all children residing in this world. Adequate provisions shall be made by a law of uniform, efficient, safe, secure, and high quality system of free public education. 
that allows students to obtain a high quality education and for the establishment. Talks about higher learning and everything else. But really, the main crux of this whole paragraph is K-12 education, being funded adequately, and being and having a consistent, uh, uniform system of education in the state of Florida. So, how have the players done? Let's first talk about that first statement, in that, and that is the education of children is fundamental value to people in the state of Florida. And I believe that, and I also believe wholeheartedly that the people in the state of Florida have put their money where their mouth is. They really have. 21 school districts have voted approved referendums allowing them to levy additional villages against their property owners. So the people who live there voted a tax against themselves. It's very rare. 26 school districts have a voter approved referendum allowing them to add additional sales taxes for school capital outlay purposes. During the 2019 election, there were 15 school tax referendums, and 100% of them were approved. Every one of them got approved. So people who live in the state of Florida, they understand that there is an expense and a need to educate students in the state of Florida, and they stood up and voted a tax against themselves. There are currently seven school districts that have both voter approved buildings or operations and a voter approved sales tax. We are one of those districts, Lake County is, and Monroe County actually has two villages voted against themselves. They have, they're, they're not full bills or partial bills, but they were voted at two different times for two different teams. One was a dental operation, and the last one was for school safety. So, we all just time to say thank you, Lake County. On August 28, 2018, the voters of Lake County approved an additional 1.75 million in add-on taxes through the voter referendum. The tax is approved for four years and will go into effect in 2019-20 fiscal year. The additional millage will provide over $17 million to both traditional and charter schools. The proceeds of the tax will be used for school safety, security, and mental health services. So our district really has asked our voters, and our voters believed in us and stepped up and voted the tax against themselves to help support both the security and mental health needs of our students, which is very important. We are very thankful for that. The other thing is, is the uh, 2001, the voters of Lake County approved a one cent discretionary instructor sales tax uh, in Lake County for 15 years. On November 15th, the voters approved to extend that for an additional 15 years. The tax is a one third split between the Board of County Commissioners, the school board, and the local municipalities. So we only receive a third of that sales tax. And then the school board uses funds to make major renovations to existing schools. We would not be able to do a lot of those renovations without that money. And then in 1996, the Board of County Commissioners signed an agreement to establish an impact fee for building new schools to address growth. We do not have the authority to levy an impact fee. We have to go through the county to do so. So the Board of County Commissioners have to approve that. During 2011, they actually voted to suspend the impact fee because the growth had cost so much, no one was moving into Lake County, and they felt it inappropriate to charge a fee if anybody did want to move here because at the time a lot of other counties had suspended their impact fees. Uh, the Board of County Commissioners agreed to reinstate that impact fee at 25% of the trial rate in 2013. Board of County Commissioners voted to increase the impact fee to 100% of the current fee study in 2015. Now we are currently going through a new study, and when we get done with that study, we're going to ask county commissioners to continue support keeping the impact fee at 100%. It is completely entirely up to them. So if you have an opportunity to speak to a county commissioner and you think that's important, you may want to remind them that you believe support and they keep that at 100%. So we talked about what the local people have done, what have the state done, what have the legislature done. We really believe that the state legislators are fulfilling the desire of a constitutional amendment that said that they had a paramount duty. Paramount means the most or highest important duty that they have. What we saw earlier in 2003 and 2018, the paramount spending has been on services other than education. So, what do we do about that? What can we do? A lot of people say, well, why don't you just raise taxes on ourselves? Well, 
we don't have that ability to raise taxes against ourselves because the state tells us we don't have we don't have that discretion. We do not have a presidential vote referendum, but we just got one past five fifty point seven five, and it would be difficult to go out and do that again. Um, so we have to contact our legislators. And we hear that a lot, and you, know, you probably hear that as a decision most of you reach out to your local legislator, explain to them the desire about what you would like to have. And we realize they're all the way to Tallahassee, and there are some local ones over here that we may have an opportunity to speak to. But it's also important to speak to those that actually are in the committees making a lot of these decisions, because although every legislator may vote on an education issue, only certain committees will bring a lot of those things into the table. So a lot of what they get voted on is never even discussed by the local person. It's just they get the vote here and they against it, of course. So contact your state district representative, your Senate president, and the chairman of the House. The Senate president and chairman of the House, they get to pick who sit on a lot of these committees, and they get to also pick on what bills get to the floor and how they look when they get to the floor. They don't have full power over it, but they have a lot of power over it. So if you're just reaching your local legislator, you might not be getting the right person for education because they may not, not be in those committees, and they may not have a, a position high up like a chair or a Senate president. Um, the education committees, both houses have an education committee. They have chairs. Um, they also have appropriations subcommittees of both houses, and they have chairs. The appropriations committee, they're the ones who tie the dollars to all the new bills. So someone comes in and creates a new bill that's a mandate, and it's the appropriation committee who decides how it gets funded. So there's actually two separate bills that go on. And if you don't have the ear of both, you may get a mandate that's not funded. So it's very important that you reach out to all of them. And then the governor of the state of Florida. Rick Scott is a good governor. Um, he, um, he produced a budget as required, like everybody else did in the past. But the local legislators a lot of times said, thank you very much, we appreciate it, but they didn't follow it at all. There's a little bit more consistency between what the governor wants and what the, the heads of the legislation wants. So I think they're going to pay a little bit more attention to what the governor's asking for. I think they're getting some things that he asked for this year. New governor, you know, new, new, new legislator, so they all work together a little bit better. So it's important to talk to the governor and, and explain to the governor the importance of that K-12 education. Not just education as a well. whole. Ask them to make K 12 education a priority by properly funding school districts to address their operating capital needs. It's that simple. You know, we need, we need to fund our education. If we expect a high quality education system, we need to fund it like a high quality education system. So, when, and I think this is important to know if you know anything about the legislative process, they meet at a specific time of the year. There's a lot of buildup going before that meeting, so there's some important things. Now, obviously, it's fresh on your mind, it's good to make that comment. Right now, you may actually have more availability of that local person because they're not in Calabasas. So now's a good time to reach out and talk to them if you have an opportunity. November is also important because that's when those committee meetings start. And those committee meetings, there's a lot of discussion going on in those committee meetings in November and December, January, leading up to the legislative session. So it's a good time to go ahead. A lot of bills are filed at the House prior to the start of the House. They, they, they've had some changes in the way they do that. And so instead of having a lot of bills filed throughout the whole time, they want most of their requests on the front end so they can already see it and talk about it throughout the whole process and not so November and through November until the beginning, and it begins in March, that's when the legislative session starts. When the legislative session starts, you really don't have a lot of opportunities to speak to the legislature. They're very busy, and we all understand that. But it's still a good time to make it send an email, make a phone call, take a talk to one of grades if you have an opportunity, but explain the delta importance of it. So that is the majority of my presentation, obviously.